Well, thank you for coming. And uh, I have some things I think you're going to enjoy tonight. Uh, I, I started into a fable last week and realized that the slides were not uh, not uh, showing up like I intended them to and like I thought they would. So I put that off. I'm going to show that tonight. All right, we'll talk about these women tonight. Um, Marineth uh, and the first 90, Kente Kawis, Nitokris. Nitokris, uh, very, actually they're all, they're all fairly interesting. Sobek Nekvaru, Hatshepsut, you have heard me speak of her, and Tawarset Sret. Uh, from the 19th dynasty. Um, there's some, I don't have it included in this lecture, uh, but there's some papyrus uh, drawings about Sobek Neferu, uh, about her being so beautiful that she petrified men with a glance and so forth. Um, that was translated from, from the hieroglyphs and on papyrus. While we get started um, with uh, Marineth. She, the, all of these women were wives, principal wives of the Pharaoh. He died, they served as king. There is no word for queen. There's, there, there are two words, woman, king. And But they were the ruler at that time. So uh, that's the reason they're included in this uh, exclusive list here. They served as king, some of them only for a short time, but uh, some of them much longer than that. Uh, her name means beloved of Neith. Now, this hieroglyph right here uh, is actually uh, an ads uh, for um, using in a, in a field to plant with and chop weeds and so forth. And it means beloved of. I think it's uh, the hieroglyph is because they were aware of the value of that silt that grew their vegetables and provided their livelihood and so forth. And Neith, Neith is, a, is a goddess who is a protector of the sun god and she uh, sometimes is shown with um, bow and arrows. Here she is shown with the cross uh, arrows uh, on this uh, standard and that's her, that's her uh, trademark. Uh, she was wife of Jer, Jer uh, one of the first kingdoms. Now there's a good bit of, one of the first kings, there's, there's a good bit of, of um, discussion still going on about who was the first ruler. Uh, some refer to him as a scorpion king. That's because of a, uh, a makeup palette, a stone uh, kind of in the shape of a shield. At the bottom is a little well where coal K-O-H-L, uh, charcoal, is ground to make the black uh, eye liner that the Egyptians used to keep mosquitoes off of them. Um, and on that palette, uh, there is a scorpion uh, and there is a little flower uh, on there that has, I think, five petals. And that symbol has been found some other place, but that thing was found in a, in a uh, dig where the charcoal from cooking fires was uh, predated, time uh, carbon dated to uh, a very early time, like 3,300 years before Christ. So it'd be 5,400 years or so back from where we are now. And so there was reason for the Scorpion King to be included as one of the possibilities for the first uh, first king. Uh, she has a large tomb at Abydos, or as the Egyptians say it, Ab Abydos. Uh, she ruled as king for her young son after her, after her husband had died. Now, this comment right here is kind of interesting because off and on you will hear people talk about the pharaohs had their servants killed and buried with them, uh, <laughs> the cabinet members. I think they realized in less than a hundred years that you weren't going to be able to get anybody to serve in the cabinet if you were going to get done away with uh, when the Pharaoh expired. But um, there are two instances of what appears to be when the king died, his servants died at the same time, buried at the same time. Only two. 
I think we talked last time about the um, development of the hieroglyphic system, uh, these little uh, calling cards that were used with a single uh, glyph, like a picture of a bird or a picture of a snake or something like that. And the man who made the wine um, tied that little piece of clay around the uh, neck of the bottle so that uh, he could identify his product and get paid for it when it was sold by the ship captain downriver or someplace. Kenti Kawis uh, ruled about 2480 B B BC. Her team, tomb is at Giza. Giza is uh, a big rocky plateau uh, just southwest of uh, Cairo, and that's the plateau on which the three great pyramids are, are located. As a matter of fact, the main Egyptian ar uh, archaeological museum, Antiquities Museum, they call it, has been moved from downtown Cairo out to that for a new building out there on that plateau. I think it, that move probably occurred about five years ago, I guess. I like the old building, it had uh, history. I have not seen the new building. The images of her show that she, she wore the false beard. You see, you can see the strap coming around her chin and so forth, and this is a mark of royalty. Uh, she may have ruled during the youth of her son, and she might be uh, the uh, mother of all the, the uh, fifth dynasty. Uh, she is uh, recognized as that by some authors. Nitrochris in the sixth dynasty, this is, a, this is an image of her, uh, the top of her stone sarcophagus. <coughs> According, Her Herodotus uh, was a Greek, and he was, um, he was one of the very early travelers to Egypt who wrote about it. We don't have the original writings of Herodotus. It, I think it was around 300 BC when he went there. And uh, of course that would be very near the time of uh, Alexander the Great, when Alexander the Great took over uh, Egypt. The, uh, the period from about 600 BC to the time of Christ uh, is known as the Greco-Roman period, because there were Greeks and Romans uh, populated, they dominated Egypt during that period of time. But other people have written that and attributed what they're writing to Herodotus. I was trying to remember one of them uh, was a very well-known uh, Greek writer. Um, can't remember which one it was, but uh, more than one. So Herodotus becomes uh, famous for his writings because several people copied what he wrote and they, they, wrote, they wrote it at a later date. So uh, it showed up in Greek writings. According to Herodotus, she, uh, she killed a uh, hundred of, of her officials because her husband was murdered. And uh, I think the legend says that she invited them to a banquet in an underground chamber and a, and a river flowed in. I'm not sure it was an underground. I have seen a, uh, uh, a, an account that it was, a, um, it was a canal that she had had dammed up and dried out. And it was a nice flat plate and they, she had all the tables lay, laid out down there and then once everybody was in there while well, she broke the dam and when the dam broke you can guess what broke loose. And she didn't want to be torn apart by wild horses or otherwise so she uh, walked on the coals. Sobek Neferu. Now Sobek is the name of the crocodile god. So this is this beautiful of the crocodile god is what this this um, be beauties of Sobek uh, or beauties of the crocodile god. Now, her, her, she is famous for use of uh, of a thing called a cylinder seal. It's a ceramic um, cylinder, about two inches, one and a half to two inches long and it's inscribed and there's a hole down the middle so you put a small uh, stick through there and in a wet clay surface you roll the seal across and it leaves a printed uh, mark of the of the person uh, who owns that uh, that seal she was a wife of Amenemhet the fourth associated herself with the powerful father inscription in inscriptions 
defied him, deified him to prove her legitimacy. And her, her seal is uh, marked Lady of Horus. And I think maybe my next slide is going to show that. Uh, here, these, these two symbols, that's the sedge plant, and this is the bee. And when you see these two symbols together, they represent Upper and Lower Egypt. The bee was uh, Upper Egypt, the, the more desert type part in the south. And the sedge plant was the more swampy area down in the, the delta near the Mediterranean Sea. Often when some pharaoh is trying to say, uh, I rule the whole land, he says, I am the king of the north and the south, the land, the two lands, both the land of the sedge plant and the land of the bee. Yes, this is her Horus name. This is a, this is a diagram of a Sarek. Uh, I meant to wear my cartouche tonight, but uh, the cartouche is a bathtub-shaped uh, uh, emblem with the name of the person inscribed inside that emblem. Uh, before the cartouche became uh, popular as a, as a calling card, so to speak, um, they used a, a serac, which was a square, um, rec uh, not square, but a rectangular uh, opening with the name of the person in here. This means the, the woman beloved of Ra. That mark is a determinative meaning. I'm talking about the sun god. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit of hieroglyphics tonight as a part of that uh, fa fable that I promised you that, that I think you're really going to enjoy. All right, let's see. Three, male de three female determinatives there noted here. That, that's a, the, the loaf of bread, which is a female determinative. The bread looks like that when you put it on a board to shove it in the oven. Here's the second one, another one, another one a little clearer than that. And the third are two of them down here. And here is another, this is the cobra, and this is the turkey buzzard. And this is another way of talking about the land of the two lands, the land of Upper Egypt and the land of Lower Egypt. The cobra is found in the delta down south, uh, not down south, up north, lower, lower area. And then the buzzard is found closer to the desert, farther south. She, her, she was omitted from the king's list at Abydos. At Abydos, there is a, um, a stairwell that's um, cut into the rock. And on that, on the walls of that, are the cartouches of I think about 120 pharaohs, one right after the other. And this is supposed to be a definitive list of everybody who ruled over Egypt. Only thing is there's some missing. I, I think there was a law against putting a woman's name on that wall because Hatshepsut does not show up. But not just women. There were some uh, people who ruled that were not thought of very well at all and their names were, were washed out. Um, Akhenaten. Akhenaten ruled for 17 years and uh, you know his his uh, youngest son Tut, King Tut, uh, uh, the pharaohs between Akhenaten and Tut, there were a couple of them in there. That's called the Armana period because Akhenaten picked up the center of government, moved it down the river uh, to a place called Tel El Armana and he closed all the temples and uh, put all the, all the uh, priests out of business. And he ruled for 17 years and it was bad news. Uh, they just had one thing after another happen to them. And some say that some of those 10 plagues of Egypt, you know, uh, the river turning to blood and um, frogs falling from the sky. I've forgotten what all the, the, the plagues are, but uh, some associate that with the rule of Akhenaten. None of those pharaohs or kings were, were included in this Abydos list. There are three uh, places you can go to find a list, a king's list. And one of them is uh, in the Turin Museum in Italy right now because of this fellow Belzoni. I mentioned him. He was a bad boy that wanted to find his way into the number two pyramid and blew, blew a hole in it with dynamite in 1817 uh, or 1818. And uh, he, he took a bunch of artifacts uh, to early, early in the exploration uh, of Egypt, uh, around 1817 to 1818, he took a bunch of artifacts to the British Museum 
and uh, excuse me, to the French, to the Louvre first and tried to sell them. They wouldn't buy, so he took them to the British Museum. They wouldn't buy. And he ended up giving a bunch of them to his home country, Italy, this little museum in Turin, um, Italy. He was from Padua, Italy. I should, I should repeat the uh, series of lectures on Bell's only one of these days because he was, he was a rascal. And uh, it's, uh, it's uh, interesting uh, to follow his... Uh, his exploits. Why would they not buy them? Uh, it was very early in Napoleon had gone there like 20 years earlier and the study of ancient Egypt had not yet gotten really important and they probably he, he, he may have asked too much I think they probably just weren't interested. Uh, you know, we look at it now and say, boy, you guys missed, uh, you know, a real opportunity. And, and if you look at the artifacts that are in the British Museum now, you can see that uh, uh, some of them are not as high a quality as, uh, as others, you know. Um, but uh, other than that, I can, I can only guess. You know, it, it may be... Um, they didn't like his personality. I mean, he, he was, you know, an unusual guy, very big guy and kind of boisterous and loud and whatnot. Hatshepsut, I like Hatshepsut. Um, she, she's the only female pharaoh. There were other female queens, but she was the only female pharaoh. Now remember, remember the difference between a king and a pharaoh. The difference is the pharaohs are descended from a line of gods, and so they are gods. A king or a queen is not, necessarily. Now this descent is followed through the, the maternal line. And I think we mentioned the fact that that the reason for that is that there, when a baby is born, there's no question about who the mother is. But there is no certainty about who the father is. So being descended from a line of gods, your mother had to have been descended from a line of gods for that lineage to be complete. Well, Hatshepsut had, uh, she had... Uh, great training for wanting to be a pharaoh because she was married to uh, Tutmosis the first first he was a kind of an old man when she married him and he I think he only ruled for like maybe six years uh, before he died but she was married to a pharaoh uh, she, her father was a pharaoh she married a pharaoh and then the, then she became the war the um, aunt or protectress pro protectress of uh, a pharaoh, Tutmosis the third. So she had close associations with Tutmosis the first, Tutmosis the second, Tutmosis the third. And those those three men ruled in sequence. There were no other in between. Question? No. Oh. Yeah, I mentioned that up here. White, uh, daughter of Tutmosis the first, wife of Tutmosis the second, stepmother and aunt of Tutmosis the third. Uh, he, he, um, was in ill health and realized he might not live too long and he was aware of his uh, wife's uh, drive, uh, determination and so forth. And he wanted to make sure that the uh, next pharaoh was his son, Tutmosis III. Uh, so he, um, he began a co-regency. She began a, a co-regency with Tutmosis III. Uh, he was quite young. And uh, the, the study of Egyptology evolves. Uh, we, we dig up certain pieces of information and uh, read the hieroglyphs and we try to find out the date that these were written and so forth. And we draw certain conclusions from those. Those conclusions are always subject to change because somebody else digs up another piece of data and it says, oh, that's what we used to think, but here's new evidence. And so new evidence comes along, we gotta modify our conclusions about this, that, and the other. So, because uh, there was all this literature about Hatshepsut that went on for quite a while, like uh, maybe 15, 20 years, uh, and then she just is disappeared off the face of the map. There's no more, no more uh, uh, writings about her. 
And we know that uh, Tutmosis III, as a young man, when he uh, got to about age 12, 14, she sent him off to military school, got rid of him, sent him off to mil military school, which was a bad mistake because the soldiers loved him. Yeah, he got to where he could ride on a chariot and shoot a bow as good as anybody from a galloping chariot. And he became, Tutmosis III eventually became known by French archaeologists as the Napoleon of ancient Egypt because of his warfare the capabilities and so forth. So it was believed because so many inscriptions have been carved out, chiseled out, eradicated of Hatshepsut, uh, there was this belief that somebody hated her guts and wanted to uh, erase her from history. Now, the Egyptians have believed for a long, long time that if you made your way into eternal life, given eternal life, uh, that would last only as long as people kept repeating your name. If people quit saying your name, you were going to turn into nothing. You were not going to continue to have eternal life. So if you wanted to um, damn somebody to hell, so to speak, uh, there's an Italian uh, 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 Damnato Italiano or something like that. It's a, it means a damned to eternal hell. Um, then you erase all of their calling cards so nobody can speak their name. If nobody speaks their name, then, then that is done. So it was believed for quite some time that, uh, that Tutmosis III resented her taking over the throne. And when he came of age, he took the throne and sent his people out to chisel out her images. I remember reading a story quite some time back, um, not a story, but an account in an archaeologist's uh, book, in which he is describing uh, the discovery of Hatshepsut. They, they knew about Hatshepsut because there were a few relics that had not been obliterated. Among them, uh, two obelisks that she built that were 97 feet tall and weighed hundreds of tons. And her obelisks are so unusual because they're chiseled out of red uh, granite. And most of the obelisks are made out of sandstone or limestone. And these are made out of red granite, and they're absolutely beautiful. There's one of them uh, that's laying on the ground. I think it was toppled by an earthquake. But one of them still stands in the great uh, temple at Karnak, that 26-acre uh, religious complex, the largest uh, religious complex physical plant in the world. We know now that that conclusion that Tutmosis III wanted to get rid of her was uh, wrong. And we know that just because they quit writing about her does not mean that she died at about age uh, 40. Because, well let me back up just a minute. So here's this British Egyptologist and he's sitting at a, at a card table out in the desert and he's got all these little stones and stuff in front of him and his, his uh, Arab um, number one digger, head of the crew of diggers is standing behind him looking over his shoulder. And he's looking at this little clay tablet the, the British guy is and he's saying, uh, I wish we knew more about uh, this guy um, Hatshepsut. And the uh, Arab says, uh, well, it's not a guy. And he said, what do you mean it's not a guy? I got this tablet right here. And he said, but that's a woman. He said, how do you know that's a woman? He said, well, because of this little loaf of bread hieroglyph down here, that is a female designator, determinant. It means we're talking about a woman here. And that was the first time they realized she was a woman, Hatshepsut. Uh, so we lost track of her mummy. We know that she had a tomb in the Valley of the Kings. She was not buried in that tomb. We don't know where she was buried. And here about 20 years ago, somebody was uh, digging through, oh, now I've got to go back to Deir el-Bahari. I, I told you a little bit about Deir el-Bahari. If you stand on the Nile and look at Hatshepsut's temple, which will be a mile and a half back across to the west, in the big mountains over there, and her temple, I wonder if I have a slide. Yes, this is Hatshepsut's temple, and it, it is, it is gorgeous. It is awesome. It is impressive. Well, you can see how sheer these cliffs are. 1,300 foot high. 
and some of them very, very uh, steep uh, that you would never be able to climb, uh, you know, unless you were a modern day climber, you would never be able to climb up those. And I think I told you about this royal cache um, at Dier El Bahari, it's the name of the town, just down to the left of, um, of Hatshepsut's tomb, where the priest discovered, uh, in the 21st dynasty, discovered this massive robbery of Pharaoh's tombs in the Valley of the Kings. And he gathered up the mummies of important Pharaohs and hid them. And it's impressive how they did this because they would have had to have done it at night because those cliffs are so visible from the Nile and from the flat land leading up to them, they would have had to have done it at night. And they, what they did is they come up the backside of that mountain, dropped these mummies down about 200 feet to a ledge at where there was a hole. They dug this hole 30 feet down and then 30 meters back. Then they buried 80 mummies in this hole. And these were all famous men that were taken out of the tombs that were being robbed in the Valleys of Kings. So in the artifacts that were taken out of that royal cache uh, was a little cedar box and it had a tooth in it and the box was labeled Hatshepsut. Her mummy was not in that. Uh, uh, of the 80 mummies they brought out of that uh, tomb burial place, um, 40 of them were royal, but her, her mummy was not in there. Probably about 20, 25 years ago, somebody in the British Museum was looking at x-rays of mummies that they had not identified and thought, you know, I wonder if that tooth fits. And it turns out uh, that tooth fit this mummy and they used that to identify the mummy of Hatshepsut. Now this story, I've, I've alluded to this before. The mummies that they had in the British Museum were the ones that were originally stolen and hidden? Yes, yes. So some of those in the British Museum, the last time I was there, they had built a um, uh, air-conditioned room. They couldn't, the uh, room wasn't big enough for all, but they would rotate some of the famous ones through there. I remember the day I was there, they had Seti there, and Ramses the Great was in that room, and I think two others, and I don't think there was any room, any more room in that little room. But yes, all of those mummies were put on barges by Gaston Mesperos, uh, right? So Hatchip said, uh, she said, I'm the Pharaoh. Uh, he's only 12 years old, I'm the Pharaoh. And they said, no, you're not the Pharaoh because uh, you're not descended from a line of gods. And so therefore you're not the Pharaoh. And she says, yeah, but I am descended from a line of gods. And they said, well, what do you mean? And she said, well, what you don't know is that when I was conceived, my mother was visited uh, by the god Amun, who disguised himself as her husband, so she thought this was her husband. Um, and so, uh, I am descended from the line of gods. And so the priest said, well, we can't top that story. We're, I guess we're going to have to accept her as a, as a pharaoh. So she was a pharaoh. Let me see if I uh, lost anything. Yeah, okay. We'll move on from here. Uh, I was trying to remember if there's any other thing I want to tell you about Hatshepsut. Uh, Why is she your favorite? Why is she? Your favorite. Well, because she's interesting. She was uh, strong enough to say, first of all, her, her training. The daughter of a pharaoh, married to a pharaoh, and the, and the uh, aunt of a pharaoh. You know? So she was always close to royalty. She knew how to rule. And uh, for about 20 years, she was, well, while he was growing up and off uh, learning military arts, uh, she ran the country and she did quite well with it. The only thing that uh, bad had happened, and this happens er everywhere, everywhere. When you have a weak ruler, the people who are supposed to be paying taxes don't pay taxes. They say, you know, we don't need to put up with that anymore. And uh, the people that, uh, that you were protecting like in Nubia or in Mesopotamia, um, and they're, they're paying up for part of your army, you know, and they say, well, we don't have to do this anymore. It's kind of like NATO, like, like what Mr. Trump thinks about NATO. They're not paying their, their fair share. Um, 
Hatshepsut did not do much of a good job about knocking those people around so they'd continue paying their taxes. So there was about a 20 year period there where it got worse. And so that when Tutmosis III came on board and took over the throne, he went to war. He went, you know, went marching up to these other countries and said, you guys haven't paid your taxes, you know. And there were a couple of interesting things that he did. Um, one of the things he would do, and this kind of set a pattern for earlier, uh, later pharaohs, he would take one of the princes of the guy who was the king in that outlying country that, that Egypt was protecting from the marauders up north. Bring that prince back to Egypt, keep him in training, put him in school there, make him learn his ABCs and hieroglyphs and everything, send him back to be the next ruler there. So now he's got a connection, uh, 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 a friend in the enemy's camp, so to speak. The other thing that he would do is he would take one of the princesses, one of the daughters of that king, bring her back and put her in the harem. No way is that guy going to attack me while his daughter is in my harem and so forth. This is, uh, uh, let me back up just a minute. If you walk up this uh, processional way and then over into this area and step into that portico, that uh, covered uh, walkway, you'll see that the back wall, it, that, that walkway is probably about 12 feet wide. The stone comes out and it's really cool under there. It's about the only place you can get out of the sun for miles around in that area. But if you're in there, you'll notice that the walls are painted beautifully and that because they're protected from the sun, the colors have remained quite vivid. We have no way of knowing if the color was refreshed between now and whenever. But in any event, the colors are vivid and uh, you can see that the colors uh, out in the sun, while they may have the same general tone, the, the um, intensity of the color is not there when the sun has been uh, shining on them. But there's a story painted on that back wall, and Hatshepsut had it painted there. And it is the story of how uh, her, her mother's husband uh, visited her disguised uh, as the god Amun, disguised as her husband. That is the story painted there. Now, there are practically no erotic uh, graffiti found in uh, Egypt. Very few. Um, now that I say that, I am remembering one about Hatshepsut. Um, oh, wow, I've got to tell you this story. Uh, her architect, who built this magnificent thing, was a guy named Sentiment. Hatshepsut had a daughter, a very young daughter. She gave her daughter to Sentiment to uh, be her guardian, the guardian of the child. The, the rumor is that she and Sentiment were having an affair. They, they were lovers. There are two pieces of evidence that support that. Well, maybe three. The fact that she gave her daughter to him to care for, that's a pretty significant thing right there. But Sentiment's tomb is on the other side of this row of mountains here. His tomb is over there. There is a passageway in the back of this, of Hatshepsut's tomb, and if you took a GPS system and you projected the uh, direction that that tunnel would, would go in the back of her tomb, and projected the dire direction of a tunnel coming out of Sentiment's tomb on the far side of the mountain, they would meet. They would meet. Those angles are quite true. Now, the workmen who built this thing, they would, um, they would come over, you see this is a path going over the mountain. The, um, they would come from a nearby village and usually work for five days and then go back home. But they slept in caves uh, in these mountains up here. And up in one of these caves there's a drawing of uh, a man and woman in union. And she is obviously a royal woman because she's wearing this wig that uh, only royal women wore that, that style of wig. And so the um, speculation is that that is a workman's graffiti s illustrating their idea that, that 
Hatshepsut and Sinemut were lovers. Oh, well, you can see why I'm interested in Hatshepsut. She's yeah. a fascinating woman, you know. <laughs> she is. She's an interesting person. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, I, I, I said that there's very little graffiti or, or any kind of uh, erotic uh, drawings, um, very little of that in ancient art. But here is a very unusual thing. On the back, this is a drawing, um, pen and ink drawing made from, a, uh, from that um, covered area in the back of her mortuary temple. Uh, and it shows something very unusual, which is their feet are, are crossed touching. And that is as close uh, as any drawing in ancient Egypt comes to, war, to a physical union, and it is intended to imply. Uh, this, this is an illustration of how a lot of Hatshepsut's references got chiseled away. You see, uh, you, can't, you can't tell who these are because somebody has, has uh, uh, destroyed the carvings, D didn't want them visible and so forth. Now in 1903 when this mummy was found and she died at, at about age 50 and I think I told you that later a tomb was fitted into, into her skull a tomb that came from a box in Deher al Bahari, the hole in the ground up on the cliffs, a little cedar box that had a tooth in it and was labeled Hatshepsut. And that tooth was used to ta attach a name to this mummy, and this is the mummy of Hatshepsut. And because there were no writings about her uh, for about the last 20 years of her life, her life uh, we worried that uh, Tutmosis III had, had her killed or something. Uh, adding to that was this destruction of a lot of her uh, carvings, wall carvings and that sort of thing. We didn't know who did that, but at one time we thought Tutmosis III did. But anyway, she did not die uh, at the time that writings about her ceased to exist. She lived for another 20 years or so, so uh, that theory kind of went out the, the window. She sent a trading expedition to uh, Kush, I believe it was, I don't know if I, uh, if I uh, mentioned that, but here, here's a, this doesn't show the red uh, texture of that granite, but her, her obelisks were absolutely beautiful. Uh, she sent a trading expedition and uh, she concentrated more on trade than on collecting the taxes of the protectorates and that sort of thing. That's why Tutmosis III decided he had to go back and kind of put a little bit of order into it. Two beautiful uh, red granite obelisks. A tomb is in the Valley of the Kings, and she was a daughter of Neferure. And I think I, I told you this, uh, this love story about uh, sentiment. Tuaroset, Ret. Tuaroset. <laughs> I have trouble with that. Yeah. Last known female king of a local indigenous dynasty. She was the final pharaoh of the 19th dynasty. I don't know if that's true. Uh, she may have been the, I, I'll have to check on this. I don't think she was a, a pharaoh. I think she was a king. And I might have meant she was the wife of the final pharaoh of the 19th dynasty. Okay, she was co-regent with her stepson. Uh, Sipta for six years, and then then independent reign over this period, uh, just just a year or so here. Buried in the Valley of the Kings in KV 14. KV the tombs in the Valley of the Kings are marked KV for Kings Valley, and then a number for the tomb. I think there are about 80 of those tombs, and I believe Belzoni discovered seven of them uh, himself. All right. So next time we'll talk about important w women. Now what we'll do is we'll take a short break and then I'll, t I'll show you this uh, fable that uh, we didn't get to last time, okay? At what age did the boys generally take over being king or pharaoh? Well, it depends. Uh, you know, uh, with King Tut, uh, it was, he was pretty, pretty young, uh, I think maybe 12, and, uh, and he was uh, pharaoh for like six years or so before he died. Um, some of them were really quite old, like uh, 42, 43 years old. Wow. Uh, 
if if their father was in good health and lived a long time, like like Ramses the Great, you know, he is he is said to have been a pharaoh for like sixty years or something. All right, uh, this this uh, next series of slides this kind of starts in the middle of a series on the literature of ancient Egypt, uh, and uh, it's kind of an interesting. Uh, series because uh, at this point, I think this may have been the, uh, yeah, it's the third session in that series. And it starts talking about the initial uh, use of hieroglyphs and writing and so forth. And you, you may find it interesting because I'm going I'm to show you a few of the slides that lead into this uh, fable that, that we're going to talk about. It comes from the art of ancient Egypt. Uh, all right. <laughs> Did you, do uh, you want to laugh at that? This, this, is a, this is an inscription from a papyrus. If you were going to write your name in hieroglyphs, you would use one of these, uh, one of these. I think there may be 3,000 uh, hieroglyphs, uh, but there are only about 500 that are commonly used. And, and this is an alphabetical use. Uh, the the uh, eagle, represents, when they're used as alphabetical, re represents the letter A. The foot represents the letter B. The uh, basket with a handle on it, the letter C. The hand, the letter D. The reed, which I call a feather, the letter E. The asp, uh, the letter F. And you'll see there's another snake down here. This is a jar stand. The uh, tapered point jar sits uh, in that. Represents the letter G. This is a, um, a um, lasso type a noose. Represents the letter H. Th this is actually a um, a wind shelter. You're looking down from an airplane on a wind shelter where the walls are about that high, and and cattle walk in here to get out of the wind. And it, it's you know, ten feet this way, ten feet this way, ten feet this way, maybe six feet, and so on. And these things are still used in, uh, in Egypt today. The single reed is, a, is an A. There's a double reed down here. Um, not A, but I. Now this is interesting. We don't know the phonetics. We don't know, if we're looking at a uh, papyrus and trying to interpret it, we're not sure of how it sounds. Up until about 600 years after the time of Christ, uh, we were pretty sure about how things sounded because the Coptics, uh, a sect of Christianity, maintained a knowledge of hieroglyphs and they spoke uh, words that were put together in hieroglyphs. But uh, I think it was a Byzantine ruler who uh, passed a, 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 um, uh, an ordinance that would dis would uh, close the, the a lot of the churches and so forth. And at that point, from about 600 A.D., uh, we lost any um, clear knowledge of uh, how things sounded. Well, when Jean-Paul Jean Champollion uh, broke the code by using the Rosetta Stone and was after that was able to translate hieroglyphs, he had a, an advantage other people didn't have, and that was he was a student of Coptic literature. So he had some understanding of the, peop the last people to be able to read hieroglyphs. Uh, the cobra has the letter J or sometimes uh, DJ J. That would be a biliteral, two, two letters. Uh, here's another basket. C and K have very similar sounds. The lion uh, represents an L and the owl an M. This is a plinth or maybe a, a platform that a statue would s sit on. This is a symbol for water, uh, waves on water, and represents the letter N. Here's another loop, uh, lasso, representing O. And this is a, a, a door, representing the letter P. Here's a hill, representing Q. Mouth, representing R. And this is a, a, a lock. Remember, I, I pointed that to you one time. It was this type of a lock where you pu push a bar between two hands like that. That's what that hieroglyph uh, represents. Um, here's a, a, a loaf of bread, represent a T, when used as an alphabetical letter. 
uh, a chick represents U, just as it represents W. These sounds are similar, and we're not sure of a distinction between them. There is no V uh, and no X. And the double read is a Y, and the Z is very similar to the S, and so it uses the same lock hieroglyph. Now, th these, these hieroglyphs or these glyphs may be used in different ways. They can be used as a letter, like the, the eagle, an A. It can be used as an object, and in that case, there's a line called a determinant, which means I'm not using that as a letter. It means I'm talking about an eagle, okay? Uh, it can be used as a sound, a as in the word eight or any other large number of variations of words that have an A in them. It can be used as an idea. Remember we said that if there was a picture of a boat with no sail on it, it means go north because the river flows north. If there's a picture of a boat with a sail on it, it may mean go south because the wind blows south and that's the way you go south. You get the boat out of the current, put the sail up, you sail south. It may be, this is, this is an abstract thought. Uh, that onk can be used in a, a wide number of ways, all of which are related to life or living somehow. Life or living. And of course, we use that in jewelry today. It's, a lot of people have jewelry that has a, an onk. And this is just an example of some uh, nicely done hieroglyphs. It's, it's on a, uh, uh, t a, a top of a wooden coffin, uh, decorated, nicely decorated wooden coffin. Okay, I'm going to skip through some of these. Uh, I use this as an uh, uh, example of how hieroglyphs can be used, okay? Here's, I think you've heard me call this the backbone of, uh, of Osiris. Uh, this is a gold necklace. These things are tied behind the neck and so forth. This is, a, these are the mountains on either side of the Valley of Kings, uh, the Nile Valley. Uh, you know this is Isis because she has a throne on her head. You know that this is Nephtes, the woman, lady of the house. And then you have these baboons. You have uh, the Ankh here. You have arms uplifting in and Ra, the sun god. You have the symbol for, the hieroglyph for uh, Nut, the goddess of the sky, okay? All of that is not necessarily obvious when you look at a drawing like this, but there's no, there's, there's no accidental inclusion here. Everything in there is, is put in there intentionally. The sun god will look like that. The goddess Isis look, look like that. Here's the necklace, gold necklace or gold, life or living. The goddess ne Nephtes, the sky goddess Nut, uh, the Jed pillar for stability and protective arms, the Nile Valley. And when you have uh, a knowledge of what those individual glyphs mean, then uh, you can see them here. There's the Ankh. Uh, here are the protective eyes, arms, Ra. Uh, I, I don't show the, uh, the uh, Newt uh, hieroglyph, but the gold uh, here. Uh, the the uh, Nile Valley here. Another gold necklace here. And it allows you to make an interpretation. And an interpretation is this is what I think it says. I think it says. The two golden goddesses, golden goddesses, golden goddesses of Egypt. Egypt. Uh, offer uh, Isis and Nephthys. Offer, hands up, in praise. Stability and protection uh, to the life of Ra, the sun god as he rises into the sky where the baboons herald the calling of, of the coming of the day. The baboons always start chattering just a few minutes before sunrise. And that's the way you, they wake you up. They're your alarm clock. Now that's only one interpretation. 
But you can see how you could derive an interpretation that would have the same idea, although not exactly the same words and so forth. <coughs> All right, now here's the fable I wanted to talk to you about. This fable is called The Treasure of King Ramsitis. Now, Ramsitis, Ramsitis had a, a, a nice gold collection. He had a lot of objects and, and uh, souvenirs and so forth uh, made from gold. And he had no place to keep them safe. And uh, so he kind of got the idea that he should hire a stonemason and build himself a safe, a room that would be protected and, and uh, nobody could break in and it was uh, made of heavy walls and so forth. So he hired a, hired a, a, a stonemason to build him a, a uh, um, <coughs> excuse me, a, a storehouse to keep his treasures in. The problem with this was that the, the stonemason had two sons and the stonemason was getting kind of old. And he gathered his sons uh, one day and he said, uh, I'm going to let you in on a little secret, okay? He said, uh, when I built this um, safe, uh, I left one block where it could be removed from the outside and I want you fellows to take care of your mother. And uh, if you ever get in a, in a bind because you, you got no cash, um, you can go in there and, and get a gold object and sell it, but just don't get caught and don't do this too often. And so he passed away and before long, sure enough, uh, they were, couldn't, couldn't get to the Kroger store. They didn't have funds to take care of their mother. So they went in there and uh, picked up a couple of objects. Uh, the problem is that King Ramsitis, unknownst to the uh, stonemaster who built it, he had a different fellow come in and put a, a booby trap in there. And when these two young boys uh, came in and, and stole an object, uh, this uh, portcullis or big rock came down, fell on one of them, trapped him. Uh, he had him, um, the lower part of his body pinned to the ground under this great big rock. And, uh, and his brother said, wow, you know, uh, what, uh, what am I going to do to get you out of here? And, and the brother laying there, he says, uh, look, I'm done for. Uh, I'm done for. Uh, you, you better save yourself, you know. And he said, well, I can't save myself. When I run out of here, uh, they're going to know who you are and they'll come get me. And he says, yeah, I guess that's right. And he said, I'll tell you what you do. You cut my head off and take it with you. That way they'll not know who I am because I'm, I'm done for anyway. So his brother does that. He cuts his head off and he takes it with him. He buries it in the backyard. <sighs> Their mother is very, very upset. Uh, you're not supposed to bury people in pieces like that. Uh, you're supposed to uh, you're supposed to have the whole body and wrap it in Johnson's gauze and make a mummy out of it and uh, and have a ceremony and everything, you know. And uh, uh, this wasn't happening, so. She really, really wanted her son to uh, do something, try to get that body. Well, then an unusual thing happened. The king said, you know, I'm trying to find out who, who it was that, that stole something out of my treasure house. And I've got this body, but it, I don't have any head. Now, I'm going to take this body and I'm going to put it on the square on the stick. And somebody will be able to come by and identify that body and they'll tell me who this was that robbed, robbed me. So, uh, you know, the, the son uh, saw what was going on here and uh, of course he told his mother about that and she said, you know, you, you really need to get that body uh, so we can bury it with the head and it'll be a complete uh, burial and he, he may have eternal life and so forth. So figure out something, you know, think of something. You're a clever guy, you broke into the, into the strong box though. So, uh, he figured out something he could do. And one day, uh, he just about dusk, uh, he comes into town leading a donkey. And this donkey has uh, uh, goat skins uh, filled with wine on, loaded on either side, just like he's going to town to sell the, sell the wine. And the two guards are sitting on the platform where the body is uh, um, tied to this stake. And uh, 
they're just sitting there smoking a cigar or something, passing the time of day. And uh, he gets kind of close and takes a knife and stabs the goat skin. Wine starts spilling out on the ground. He says, holy mackerel, I'm losing my wine. Anybody got a cup? Come on, get some, because I can't, I can't. Uh, you remember I told you there are a lot of fables where the, the predicament is solved by somebody getting drunk. Well, <laughs> sure enough, the guards, the guards drink wine and drink wine. Finally, they fall down on the ground and go to sleep. Well, uh, he, uh, he uh, uh, puts the body on his, on his donkey and takes it home and buries it in the backyard where the head is. So uh, King Ramsentis is uh, really, he's really hacked off about this, doesn't like it a bit, not a bit. And so he, he hatches a plan. Now this is really very clever. This is very clever. He's gonna set a trap to catch this guy. He takes his most beautiful daughter and turns her into a working girl. Now, she does not take cash and she doesn't take a MasterCard. But um, what the price of her favors is that you have to tell her a story of some trick you played on the king. If you can tell her a story of some trick you played on the king, then you may be favored with by her presence. So, the remaining son has got a look at her, and he is smitten, <coughs> and he has to have her company. So he hatches a plot. Turns out that a, a beggar about his size died, and the body was lying on the us in a ditch on the outskirts of town. He goes over there and cuts the arm off that body, and he he tucks the arm up under his sleeve of his big gullabia, and uh, he walks over to the window where. Uh, the king's daughter is trying to drum up business. And he says, uh, hey, how about, uh, how about I get to spend the night with you? And she says, uh, first you've got to tell me a story about how you played a trick on the king. He says, well, me and my brother, we, drove, we broke into the storeroom and we stole some of his gold. She says, ah, I got you. And she grabs him by the arm. <laughs> he turns it loose. She pulls his cut off arm in the window. He turns around and runs away. Well, <laughs> the king, <laughs> the king uh, uh, offers a reward for this guy and he decides that uh, did, whoever did this is too clever for us. I think I want him on my side instead of uh, loose out there somewhere. So uh, supposedly this fable ends up that he and the king's daughter got married and lived happily ever after. I thought you might enjoy that, that fable. It's one of my favorites. You know, it's a little hard for us to uh, relate to a story of a beggar cutting a guy's arm off. So, but, but think of, you know, two or three thousand years ago, they believed in spirits and all kinds of things, you know, so they probably took that much more seriously than we did. Well, anybody have any questions? Otherwise, I think we're going to wind up a little bit early tonight. Just yes. Sorry? You spoke of 11 Cleopatra. I, I'm, I'm not sure of the number, but there were many. All right. Why, why was that? Was it, was Cleopatra, was that just sheer coincidence or was it a title? You know, I don't know the answer to that. I was asked a question about uh, that time period earlier, and I'm, I'm just not competent to answer that because I've not made a study of the Greco-Roman period. I've, I've always felt like that period uh, would be an offshoot of the study of Greek history. And uh, I was a lot less interested in Greek history than in Egypt history because of my trips to Egypt, you know, and, and my background with uh, Egypt. So uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I just don't, I'm not qualified to answer that. Now, I gave you a true answer. I don't know. <laughs> well, then we're adjourned and we'll hope to see you next week.